and good morning. We're officially live only on OneDealAway.com. My name is Nev and welcome to Money Matters. I am beyond excited to share with you a few of the things that I have actually been able to find. And uh, today we're actually going to be talking about a ginormous amount of money that has been transferred from one account to another when it comes to Bitcoin. And it sent some sort of alarms throughout the network and individuals. And uh, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, reports uh, that uh, talk about potential uh, business bankruptcies and what we can expect to see. We're going to be uh, looking at what happened with the economy as far as like the jobs and so on, because there have been some controversies of what's being reported, what's not being reported, how accurate it is. Um, you know, and uh, I'm actually going to show you an article. So yesterday we talked about uh, Peter Schiff, who said Bitcoin is useless because you can't even buy stuff. So, Peter, um, I have found uh, uh, something very simple that you can actually buy with Bitcoin, and uh, I think you're going to like it. So um, that's kind of what it is. And then we're going to do a bit of a study session today where we're going to explore of our mind and how do we improve our lives. And so I'm really excited about all of this stuff. So let's do this. All right, so let's uh, let's let's get started and uh, talk about important stuff. Uh, this is not big enough at all. All right, now 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 we can get busy. Now we can talk. Here we go. Now you can actually read this stuff. And uh, and uh, in a in a full disclosure, I didn't have as much time this morning as I thought I would because I. Uh, I overslept. I slept in. And so uh, typically I get up around, I don't know, 4.35 a.m. So I have plenty of time to read and prepare and do my thing. Uh, but this morning, I, you know, I must have been exhausted and my body needed it. And so I, um, I didn't wake up until like 6.13. And I remember because that's what the clock said. And uh, so anyways, um, but that's OK. This is exciting piece. So. Um, we're going to learn a lot of these things together. So I found uh, some very, very cool articles. And one of them is the U.S. business bankruptcies. So it says it skyrockets uh, by 48% in May. So uh, basically is, uh, you know, what they're arguing, saying the absolute failure of the small businesses bailouts is now evident. With the recent explosion of bank business bankruptcies, the chance of a V-shaped recovery are non-existent and we need to question what happens next. The mainstream media is hinting already at what to expect as reports of COVID infections are becoming more prevalent. More lockdowns are coming either at the state or federal level, which means any business that does not receive a bailout is about to be crushed if they have not been already. The last bailout saw around 13% of businesses get money while uh, the rest got nothing. Set aside for set aside the long-term hyperinflation problem, the stimulus will create even the short-term prospects are grim for the economy. The majority of the 40 million lost during uh, 40 million jobs lost during the first lockdown are not coming back. Business bankruptcies are proof of this, but you haven't seen anything yet. In the next couple of months, you will start to hear about new lockdowns, and this will be the final blow to the already damaged U.S. economy. And if you think that this was sort of like written right in, in, in March or April, um, no, this is, uh, this is as of yesterday. So this is yesterday evening uh, report that was written, and uh, it's basically arguing. So what we're seeing, uh, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to what's going on uh, around the, uh, uh, I don't want to call it around the world because that's sort of silly. Uh, but I don't know if you've been seeing of, as to what's going on and what's been happening. And um, But as the economies are reopening, they're starting to notice that the number of cases is starting to go back up, which makes sense if you think about it, right? Uh, you know, it, you, you, you've had people in their homes and they're not interacting. So, of course, you can't pass anything to anybody because nobody's seeing anybody. 
But now, now people are actually going out and about and seeing people, interacting with people. And uh, next thing you know is, well, you know, things happen and somebody might be sick. They might pass it on. Uh, so we're seeing that happening. Uh, you know, uh, I've seen reports from like schools are opening to like, never mind, never mind. Schools are back to closing. Uh, we've heard of uh, many different countries that had, had happened that uh, that second wave is coming back and it's not like even second wave of what they're talking about on TV of like things coming back in fall and winter of this year, uh, but coming back like as soon as we reopen. So it's definitely going to be something very, very interesting. And, you know, as people relax or don't relax, you know, do they wear the mask? Do they not wear a mask? Uh, so it's very interesting. And so uh, the author, Brandon Smith here is arguing that, you know, we're going to see more of this stuff coming in and the government is going to say, uh-uh, we let you out. You got to go back in. That's it. We're closing it. So uh, we'll see what happens, right? I mean, none of us know. But one thing we do know, one thing that I did expect and that I did talk about quite a bit um, over the last uh, couple of months is the uh, my expectation for the business bankruptcies to start coming in and coming in hard. And it sounds like for some businesses, you know, bankruptcy is not a big deal. Like it's actually a highly profitable time. Hertz comes to mind. Uh, again, it blows my mind that people would actually end up investing and throwing their money at the stock that literally just filed for bankruptcies is written uh, with, with having all of these obligations as far as the cars and stuff. But nobody's going to travel. So um, I, I am flabbergasted, but there we are. Um, you know, and we'll see. I could be I could be very much wrong and could be proven wrong. And um, I don't you know, my ego is not that big. Um, so I'm OK with being wrong uh, and learning from it. Right. So businesses declared. Sorry, bankruptcies declared by businesses, not businesses declared by bankruptcies, although that would be fun. Bankruptcies declared by businesses in the U.S. rose nearly 50 percent in May as the economy continues to feel the sting of the coronavirus pandemic. In May alone, 722 businesses across the country filed for Chapter 11, according to legal services Epic Global. Uh, and this is coming from the Wall Street. So that's uh, uh, 50, almost 50 percent, 48 percent from May of 2019, right? Uh, that's that's a huge thing. And, you know, I, I would argue, I, again, I'm not I'm not a professional. I, I, my crystal ball uh, broke years ago. But I would argue that we can expect to see that this 722, uh, you know, potentially becomes 14 or 1500 for June or July. Um, and the, the reason is that I think some of the folks might have been holding on. Some of the folks might have been, you know, hoping and praying that things are going to work out. And, you know, in month of May, they weren't prepared because you can't filing for bankruptcy. It's not like calling your brother-in-law and saying hello. Like it doesn't work that way. You actually have to file paper and it takes a while to do that stuff. So, you know, we're some of the stuff that we see, I think, are going to be larger companies that were basically preparing to do this since March, right? Like they shut down, they went home, they sat behind a computer and started basically filling out paperwork to file for bankruptcy. Um, and uh, But I think a lot of the smaller companies weren't necessarily, you know, thinking to do that. And so, you know, they might be preparing paperwork in May or even now in June and, and the reason that makes me think that is because not just the pandemic, but now the riots. So if you if you got decimated financially from the pandemic and then you had like a little bit of a hope and stuff to come in and then they went through and like destroyed your company and and took all of your inventory and everything else or set it on fire or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy. It makes it very easy to say, you know what, I'm just going to claim uh, uh, insurance. I'm going to take my money. I'm going to go uh, through the bankruptcy filing and I'm out. I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to go and try something new. I'm going to build something different. And I think a lot of that is going to happen. And I think a lot of those individuals are going to move to potentially creating some sort of online business 
or if they're a bit more savvy, they might become um, investors in the business, basically saying, yeah, I want my money to work. I want uh, I want my money to, to make more money, uh, but I don't want to be the one to work. And if you also think about it, vast majority of business owners um, are um, actually baby boomers. And, you know, if you know anything about baby boomers is that they're, well, aging, right? I mean, all of us are aging, right? Like I am a year older this year than I was last year and will be a year older next year than I am this year. So all of us are aging, right? But what I'm saying is that at, uh, starting and running a business is a is a very, very challenging thing, mentally, emotionally, physically, um, financially. Um, and so th- it requires a lot of commitment. It requires a lot of drive. It requires a lot of, uh, you know, things that you have to do and sacrifice and all of these different things. And at some point, you know, uh, you have to be, uh, relatively speaking, young and healthy individual who are very committed to that stuff because at some point it's very easy to just throw everything away. It's it's very easy to go back and sit and, and just watch a, a movie. I mean, I will, I will tell you, like, um, and this is not a complaint, but I, I'm just, uh, you know, thinking as we're talking about these things. Uh, I go through, uh, you know, I don't know. Last time I saw a movie uh, was probably this past weekend. And I watched, it was a, what, like a two-hour movie. Um, and it took me four days to watch it because I don't have two hours a day to sit and watch a movie. Um, and uh, But I needed a break and I needed to do something different. So I rewarded myself with a movie uh, that I got to watch over the course of like, you know, four days. So, um, so, you know, it's like 15, 20 minutes a day. And, uh, then I got to go and do stuff because, you know, from the time I wake up to the, to read and, and do the stuff. And then, uh, you know, you go back in and you start working on things and you start tweaking and problems come your way and challenges come your way and staff starts asking questions and people are not happy. And you got to go in and constantly be doing stuff and solving things and solving problems. Um, and, uh, you know, so it can definitely take a toll. Um, and, uh, especially if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then, you know, it, it's super easy to quit. Um, so you gotta love what you're doing, obviously. Um, and you gotta enjoy what you're building and creating, but, I can definitely see how and why somebody in their, you know, 50s or 60s where you've been like fighting uphill, fighting uphill, fighting uphill, fighting uphill. And then, you know, wham, wham, wham. It's like, you know, uh, direct uppercut cross and you are out. And, uh, um, you know, you're just done. Um, So I could see why that would happen. So, uh, but they're basically saying that, you know, we've seen this rise. And they're saying since March and the onset of pandemic, the U.S. economy has taken a nosedive, shedding over 40 million uh, jobs, uh, ballooning the country's unemployment rate. Well, we already knew that, right? Now, Friday was the good news um, um, Friday morning when uh, Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics announced in a uh, huge surprise that the economy added jobs in May and that unemployment rate fell. Uh and then Congress passed multiple coronavirus stimulus packages, adding to trillions of dollars. But many industries, as service and airlines, are still struggling to reopen. So uh, this was one of those things that I think was an interesting piece to take a look at. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, I agree. It's, it's definitely a struggle. Now, in this next article, it's coming from Mesh Talk. Um, and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, he's basically saying that, uh, 15 years wiped out, uh, but jobs are still overstated. So unemployment in total non-farm January 2002 to May 2020. I'm going to have some coffee while you take a look. All right. So as you can see, he's basically saying that we're back at the levels where we were, I don't know, 20 years ago. Uh and so he's uh, uh, saying that the start of the recession, oh, okay, so I guess it has been. The BLS admits errors in the unemployment rate. The NBER agrees. The NBER declared the start of the recession today um, in February. Uh, one of the reasons was a downturn in employment. Uh, the economy peaked, entered recession in February 2020. 
So I guess we are officially starting to call it now. My gosh, do you see what I mean? Like it's, they can't call it when it's happening. And so if you're relying on people to tell you, or you're relying on the leadership to say, hey, we're in recession, you are like at four to six months behind, if not even longer. So you can't rely on those things to start behaving differently or, you know, planning for it. So, uh, so what he's saying is that the economy peaked at a recession in February uh, 2020. So month of the peak. In determining the date of the monthly peak, the committee considered a number of indicators of employment and production. Uh, they normally view the payroll employee of employment. Um, Employment measures, which is based on large survey of employers, as the most reliable comprehensive estimate of employment. Okay, so uh, they look at employment. All right, we got that piece. Uh, they are saying that the series reached a clear peak in February. Uh, duh, everything peaked in February. Everything peaked in February, and then it went down. Uh, individuals who are paid but not working are counted as employed, uh, right? doesn't make sense, right? For paid but not working are counted as employed. I guess it makes sense. Even though they're not, in fact, working or producing. So, you know, so I guess the, the from the financial perspective, it kind of makes sense of why you would count them as, as working, quote unquote, um, um, and you wouldn't count them in the un unemployment numbers. But if you look at it from the productivity, uh, their output is zero, right? I mean, their output is zero. Workers on paid furloughs who became, hold on, you can't see it, uh, who became more numerous during the pandemic thus resulted in an overcount of people working in recent months. Um, so this is the part we're saying like uh, BLS, like it's not, it's not quite correct. And that's the part that I was arguing for a while. So according to the, the committee, also considered the employment measure from the Bureau of Labor Statistics household survey, which excludes individuals who are paid but on furlough, right? Okay, we already know that. Um, and so they uh, understate the collapse of employment during the second half of March, as indicated by unprecedented level of new claims for unemployment insurance. The committee concluded that both um, employment series were thus consistent with a business cycle peak in February. So NBER, um, confirms what I said last Friday in surprise, the BLS admits another phony job report. Um, I don't know that it's phony y'all. Uh, I just think it's not hundred percent accurate and I don't think they do it to mess around with anybody. I just think it's, you know, like I, it's, it's, I could see it being challenging for them to count. Right. And to come up with very specific rules of like, well, if somebody's working, uh, but not paid, are they unemployed or employed? But if consequently, if they're paid but not working, do you count them, do you not? So those are some of the things that I think are very important for us as a whole, as a group to understand and agree to, almost like a you know, protocol, if you would, that we say, okay, these, these are the rules, right? If people are getting paid, whether they work or not, they're considered employed, done, right? If people are, it doesn't matter if they're working or not, but they're not getting paid, they're not considered employed. So I think we need to have some uh, better understanding of, of what's going on and what we can expect, right? So they are basically um, investigating why misclassification error continues to occur. They're taking steps to um, address it. And so, you know, and again, here you go. Mish, just like me, is saying they're not, they're not doing this on purpose. Like he's just, you know, challenged to come up with all of those things. And uh, what they're saying is that even though they were saying on Friday that the unemployment numbers have like uh, dropped down and stuff, they're basically saying that uh, it wasn't 100 percent accurate and that the number they reported uh, because of the changes of how they should have done it, but they didn't, uh, the unemployment number would have been about 3 percent higher. So, um, you know, so instead of that 15, 16 percent, it's closer to 20 percent again. Um, I've been saying that we're at 20 and above 20% uh, for a while, um, and I'm, I'm sticking to my to my sort of point of view. Uh, but you know, uh, again, so here is the uh, the lead chart is from BLS. They use the word employment, although they are really referring to non-farm jobs. Employment is worse. So uh, so there you go. This is the uh, the level 
the employment level. But they're saying the employment level, and Mesh is basically saying that they use the word employment, although they're really referring to non-farm jobs. Employment is worse. Despite way better than expected bounce in, uh, in employment in which the unemployment rate is admittedly several percentage points too high, uh, the actual employment level is less than it was in January of 2003. Um, so, you know, he's looking at this stuff and saying, hey, hey, this is where we were in May 2020. This is where we are in January 2003. Um, and, you know, we'll see kind of where it goes. Consumer credit declines an amazing 68.7 billion. Uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's amazing. So revolving credit fell an annualized um, almost 65%. Clearly, consumers have a lot more rebalancing to do. Um, equally clearly, the Fed wants to prevent just that 68.7 billion is an unprecedented decline, but what's coming or doesn't is more important. So decline in mortgage forbearance plans, but payments drop too. The good news is decline mortgage forbearance plans. The bad news is payments drop as well. So that's, uh, yeah, that's not necessarily good. So number of people needing to go into forbearance is good. Uh, but the, the, the number of people actually, you know, being able to pay is, is not so good. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I've expected that stuff to happen, right? Like we talked about that not everybody who enters the forbearance is going to be able to get out. Um, for the vast majority of people who enter forbearance, they are basically just delaying the inevitable. And I think that um, all of these like loans and all of these programs that the government is trying to do to goose things up is just uh, delaying the inevitable or inevitable, 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 inevitable. There we go. I'm certain that is my final answer. Um, so it's it's uh, it's definitely interesting, right? To sort of pay attention to. Uh, they're saying a rebound is underway, but realistically, where is it going? Percentage-wise, the rebound may look good, but it will take years to just get back to the economy where it was before COVID-19 hit. So not as exciting of the news coming from Mish, right? Um, but I think it is important for us to be able to, to, to learn and consider as to what's going on. Okay, so that's, that's sort of uh, uh, where I will you know, where I think we need to kind of consider and to go. Now I want to switch really briefly to sort of like uh, the Bitcoin conversation. And then we're going to end it with something that I think is probably uh, the coolest piece ever of like us, our ability to be able to learn. And so some tips from probably uh, the best entrepreneurs, the wealthiest of individuals out there of like, how do they do what they do and how do they get where they get? So if you are into that stuff, this is definitely uh, something we're going to be covering in the show, in this episode today. So, uh, but first, let's talk about Bitcoin really briefly. So Peter, this one is for you. Coca-Cola, Amatil, vending machines, accept Bitcoin via Centropay. So remember yesterday, I talked about how Peter Schiff was saying, Bitcoin is stupid. You can't even buy anything with it. And... Uh, you know, it turns out, I don't even know if you can see this. I might have to zoom in for a bit. There we go. This is much better. Um, so it turns out that uh, in um, Austria, um, Austria, Australia, Australia, very different and way different location too. <laughs> um, so um, New Zealand and, and Australia uh, have this uh, new smart wallet thingy that allows you to buy Coke with Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency sounds like as well. So Auckland, New Zealand, uh, June 9th, which is basically today, uh, they're just like super ahead of us come time zone wise. Uh, so Centropay, the digital asset in, in integrator has signed agreements with Coca-Cola, Amatel in Australia and New Zealand, and they will use the cryptocurrency to pay for items. 
Coca-Cola Mattel is the largest bottler and distributor in Asia Pacific, supporting 140 brands and 270 million consumers. Consumers can use their Silo Smart Wallet at any of the Coca-Cola's 2,000 plus vending machines with a QR code payment sticker. So it's a, this is exciting piece and I'm actually going to play this for you so you can see this silly video and uh, I'll, I'll zoom it in. She's basically saying like, how do you do it? So in case you're curious as to how they do it, there you go. She's going to go in, open her app, you know, unlock the wallet, select what she wants to buy, scan it and boom, done. And Welcome to uh, 2020, y'all. Welcome to 2020. And as you can see, you know, it's it's done. It's simple. It's done. And uh, there you go. That's that's kind of the exciting piece that I, you know, um, I wanted to share with you. So if Peter says, you know, it doesn't really work, well, clearly, clearly, um, either you don't know how to work it or you're not paying attention, my friend. So. Okay, another news that is incredibly important, I think, for the fans of the crypto community or those just sort of curious and learning is uh, uh, the news that broke out that says Bitcoin whale moves entire wallets in 194 million uh, transactions, right? So in brief, there was a wallet uh, and whale is uh, for for um, audience who is not as familiar with with cryptos and stuff is basically a person that has like a lot of bitcoins and uh, so they call him a whale um, and I don't know if you knew this so if you did you know uh, uh, let me know in the chat or in the comments and be like Don Ev uh, because you know I do live under a rock most of the time and uh, I do understand that sometimes I have this like this is brilliant and everybody looks at me and says. Nev, this has been existing for years, my friend. Welcome to uh, whatever. So <laughs> anyways, uh, so uh, one of the largest Bitcoin wallets has moved its entire wallet in a single 20,000 Bitcoin transaction. The transaction triggered alerts due to its massive size. Okay. Now here it talks a little bit about the transaction call, uh, cost and stuff and how, you know, it's actually, you know, it's it's been pretty fine since the the halving it actually been on decline um and uh you know they're looking at sort of what happened uh within it and uh, the balance in btcs and then in us dollars and then according to bit info charts the bitcoin address has been continually accumulating bitcoin from late 2018 until early march of this year the last inflow was on march 2000 uh, march 9th 2020, just before Black Thursday, until today, the wallet had no outgoing transactions. And uh, and then, well, and then it did, and then it did, and it moved everything. Now, uh, one of the other things that they are putting into this report that I think it's very interesting is that the institutional sentiment rises. The crypto sphere has also seen a rise in institutional sentiment in 2020. Grayscale, a leading digital asset investment company, has been adding more Bitcoin to its Bitcoin trust uh, than are now mined. Grayscale recent influx of new money is evidence that the institutional sentiment surrounding Bitcoin and currency is changing. And uh, they're basically saying that we've mined 6,800, but Grayscale bought well over 9,500. And for me, this is incredibly bullish because if you think about it, if, uh, uh, you know, if Grayscale is the only one and doing that, that means they're accumulating at a ridiculous rate. But if you have just 20, you don't even have to have everybody, just 20 large institutional investors going in and buying at the rate that uh, Grayscale is buying, uh, because the supply is very limited, demand is exploding as far as the number of Bitcoins because they don't go in like you and I and buy like half a Bitcoin or one Bitcoin or two Bitcoins. They go and buy 9,500 Bitcoins, right? 10,000 Bitcoins. Like that's the level of what they buy. So if you think about it of how that is shifting and how that is changing and what it has potential to do when people say, you know, I can see Bitcoin going, you know, to 100,000 or 400,000 or a million. 
you know, I think they might be underestimating it because I think you would be shocked at the peak when people start jumping in. And it's one of those things that uh, Raul Paul uh, of Real Vision talks about it as well, where he says, you know, it's a, it's a FOMO thing. And I, I want to say it was him. Uh, I, if I'm wrong, I apologize. Please do correct me in the chat or in the comments, depending where you look or where you're watching this stuff. Uh, hopefully you are watching live on One Deal Away. Uh, but if you are, you know, not an early riser, maybe the next article will change your mind. Uh, but anyways, let me know in the comments. But anyways, he said that as the price keeps going up, that more and more people will start jumping in, thus raising the price even higher. So I think we're going to see that because we've seen Grayscale kind of jump in. We've seen Raul Paul kind of talk about it. We've seen Paul Tudor Jones kind of come in. We're going to see people sort of stacking in. And at some point, right, there's a thing called tipping point. Uh, and at some point, it sort of tips. And when it does, there's no stopping this puppy for a very long time. So um, anyways, that's just kind of how I, I feel, where I stand. And, uh, um, you know, as you can see, I am incredibly bullish about this whole thing. Okay, coffee. Let's go in. This is going to be, this is probably a favorite part of this episode right now because we're going to be talking about learning in some, um, they call it in the article, the uh, the five-hour rule. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think it's a really powerful piece. And like I said, if you're not an early riser, if you're not uh, daily watching these things, joining me and doing stuff, I think uh, this particular article will change your mind. So let's switch it and let's talk about it. So accelerated intelligence, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Oprah all use the five-hour rule as does Nev, and are you as well? That is my question to you. <laughs> Excuse me. Top business leaders often spend five hours per week doing deliberate learning. That doesn't mean like I stumble on stuff. That means deliberate means I schedule things, I run with it, and I move on. And so this is a really interesting article, and we're going to read it together. So basically, it's, it's arguing and saying, which I agree, is that if you're looking for a way to improve your life, you absolutely need to start learning on a daily basis. This is not sort of, eh, I read a book when I was in college, and I am done. I will tell you all. When I finished the undergrad, when I finished my bachelor's, you know, I mean, I I rushed through that bachelor's so hard. I think I, I finished my four-year degree in uh, two years and seven, eight months, something like that. So, like, in under three years, I finished my bachelor's degree. Not because I'm super intelligent, it's because I couldn't afford to be there for four years. So, I had to cram. So, my uh, college years are a giant blur. I don't remember very many things under the fact that I took a lot of classes and I worked my behind off. Um, and then after that, you know, for a couple of years, I was like, eh, I'm done. I don't want to do anything. All I did was play video games and watch TV. Um, then my girlfriend at the time was basically calling me out saying, you said something about getting your MBA and stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, why did I, me and my big mouth, why did I have to say something? So thanks to her, and I am forever indebted to her for pushing me, um, I enrolled into an MBA and obtained the MBA. Now, when I finished that, uh, and I was like, nope, not reading anything ever again. And, uh, uh, you know, and I didn't for, for a while. I mean, I would read an occasional uh, fiction or whatever, or, you know, mostly was sort of movies and going out and playing video games and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then I lost all of my money in 2008. And, um, uh, I think you all know my story already, uh, because I wasn't reading and I wasn't studying. And I thought that what I had received in school, what I had received in college was everything that I needed to receive. And that's simply not accurate. You know, maybe that worked 40 years ago, uh, maybe even worked 20 years ago. It doesn't work today. Things are moving consistently, changing and shifting. And you got to keep upgrading the hardware and the software if you are to continue to compete. And, you know, that 2008, uh, losing all of my money, getting myself deeply in debt, like 
struggling, super, super struggling financially was the best education in the world because it set me down the path of becoming a deliberate learner, deliberate lifelong learner. I started acquiring books. I started reading books because it's not just getting a book. You got to read the darn thing as well, right? And you got to read it all the way till the end. And you got to study it. And it's not just sort of read. Like I study books. I underline. I highlight. Well, I don't highlight. I don't know why I keep saying I highlight. I really don't. I use a pencil in my, I don't know. It's something about, there's like this rule in my head that it's only pencil is allowed. Uh, So I know I'm silly, but. I read and I underline and I take notes and I research on it. And so it takes me a bit longer to read. I won't lie. So I'm not as fast of a reader reader as some of these folks. But anyways, so let's take a look. So um, basically the, the author of the article is saying, I've explored the personal history of many wildly administered, uh, admired business leaders to understand how they apply the principles of deliberate practice. Set aside at least an hour a day or five hours a week over their entire career for activities that could be classified as deliberate practice of learning, the five-hour rule. And uh, what that reminds you of, right? Now, we do something a little bit different than Money Matters here. We do what? The seven-hour rule. Every morning, we show up here, right, at 7 a.m., only on OneDealAway.com. Every morning at 7 a.m., we show up and we learn together. We read the articles. We consider what this means. We discuss of what's happening. That is learning. That is very deliberate. And there's a reason why I do it early in the morning because, you know, by the time the day sort of progresses and stuff, you you miss the opportunities and your brain is not as sharp. You know, uh, quite some time ago, I've learned that some of the best individuals or the, 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 the most successful, I don't know if they're best. But most successful individuals on the planet, they get up early and the first thing they do, first thing they do is they actually do things for themselves, like read, learn, reflect, work out. So they got to do those things. So that's the reason why we do this super early every single morning here so that you finish it in an hour, you can move on and you're that much smarter. And we sort of level up on it. And so, you know, in one day, it doesn't feel like it's a whole lot because it's just one hour. Neither does in one week. Neither does in one month. But give me a year, five years, 10 years. Good luck for the crowd keeping up with you or I, right? So anyways, how the best leaders follow the five-hour rule? Into three buckets, reading, reflection, and experimentation. So read. And here we go. Let's, Let's look at what people do. Buffett spends five to six hours per day reading. Bill Gates reads 50 books a year. Mark Zuckerberg reads at least one book every two weeks. Elon Musk apparently grew up reading two books a day. Mark Cuban reads more than three hours every day. Arthur Blank, co-founder of Home Depot, reads two hours a day. Uh, Entrepreneur David Rubenstein reads six books a week. Dan Gilbert, owner of Cleveland Cavaliers, reads one to two hours a day. So they read, they study. We are reading and studying here. It's not a book necessarily, but we're reading and studying here. You know, Buffett reads, when he reads, he reads the newspapers and corporate reports, right? So because here we're focusing on some of the investment components and the money and the business, we're reading, we're understanding what's going on so that you can apply this in your life, right? Um, And so now comes the second piece, right? And this is the piece that I actually hope you're doing stuff that we spend the hour here reading, right? Then hopefully throughout the day, based off of what we learn, what we read, that you'll spend a little bit of time reflecting of what does this mean to me? How does this affect me and my business? So the second way that you can actually deliberately learn is to reflect in a form of reflection and thinking time. So that could be LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner um, scheduled two hours of thinking time per day. Brian Scudamore of O2E Brand spends 10 hours a week just thinking. Uh, You know, there are people who uh, blog. There are people who call friends. Ray Dalio, he makes a mistake. He logs it in. He sends it to everybody. Everybody reads it. Then he meets with them and says, all right, what did I do? How did I fix this? Right? Entrepreneur Sarah uh, Blakely is a longtime journalist. So 
one of the key things. So the second thing you want to do, first thing is you want to be here at 7 a.m. and you want to watch this thing. The second thing is once this thing is over, while you're getting yourself ready for, you know, maybe you go for a jog, maybe you are getting ready for breakfast, whatever you're doing, maybe you're getting ready for work, time to start thinking and reflecting, what does this mean for me? What did we just cover in the show? What did I learn from the whole thing? And how does that apply to me, to my money, to my business, whatever else, the reason that you're here and hopefully you're here so that you can improve your wealth. When you start thinking that way, you can go in and start getting some ideas that are saying, okay, this was brilliant. I'm going to jot this down somewhere. And I will tell you, I have many journals. I always carry a book and a journal with me and people know me by that. Uh, well, book journal and most often the umbrella and then stacks to mom. So that one is for mom right there because she said, you never know when it's going to start raining. And you know what? That woman has saved me so many times. So thanks, mom. Thanks you. Thank you again. And then the third thing you want to do is experiment, which is apply your knowledge, apply your thinking, right? So learn, reflect, and experiment, or as I like to say, apply. Ben Franklin set aside time for experimentation, masterminding with like-minded individuals, and tracking his virtues. Google famously allowed employees to experiment with new projects with 20% of their work time. Facebook encourages experimentation through hack a months. And so, you know, and they're saying that the experiment also might be Thomas Edison. So this is the part where you'll actually go in and you'll try new things. It doesn't matter if it works. Go out there, be brave, stretch yourself, right? Test it out, see what works, see what doesn't. And I think you'll be amazed to see how um, how quickly you can actually progress and improve. And uh, this is the part where they're talking about the improvement rate. The idea of deliberate practice versus just working hard is often confused. Most professionals focus on productivity and efficiency, not improvement rate. Now, the, basically what it's saying is that very many people are focused on being busy, but being busy without actually producing better results, faster results, or results that are actually 10x from where they were before, right? So it's not just working hard, right? This is the part of that working smarter, right? It's, it's the not necessarily focusing on just speed, right? Um, and being productive. It's also the, you know, how much have I improved? Like how much better am I at doing this stuff? And what they're saying is that just five hours of deliberate learning a week can set you apart. Okay. And so basically say is that you just showing up to Money Matters, right? Live at 7 a.m. on onedealaway.com and watching this uh, can set you apart tremendously. And then if you implement things that I'm sharing here with you, which is spend a little bit of time of thinking and reflecting, journal, journals are amazing, right? Um, and then experiment, it, you'd be shocked, shocked how quickly you'll actually end up moving. And like I said, at first, you don't see anything because what it does, it's, it's like a, you know, the exponential sort of curve where uh, the L stick, where nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and boom, all of a sudden, it's like explodes. That's what we're talking about. Um, now, the really great CEOs, if you spend time with them, they are really encyclopedic uh, of their knowledge. So basically, they hold on all this information. The path that makes much sense for most people is to spend five to 10 years getting skills. We should look at learning like we look at exercise. Think more deeply about what the minimum amount of learning the average person should do per day in order to have a sustainable and successful career. So what they're saying is that, you know, we have this sort of like the minimum amount of steps, the minimum glasses of water, the minimum, you know, this sort of vegetable or that kind of fruit or, you know, all these different things. And what they're saying is we should have minimum amount that everybody should spend deliberately learning. The minimum uh, does of those of deliberate learning uh, for leading a healthy life economically. The long-term effects is not learning of not learning are just as insidious as the long-term effects of not having a healthy life. CEO of AT&T says that those who don't spend at least five to 10 hours a week learning online will um <clears throat> Learning online will obsolete themselves with technology. 
So basically what he's saying is that if you're not spending time learning and practicing deliberate learning components, so which is, again, read and study, think, 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 and reflect, and then experiment with it, and then you go back and you study from it again, and you repeat the cycle, uh, you're going to become obsolete. And I absolutely agree with it because, you know, things are moving so quickly. So if you're not doing it, um, you're losing a big deal. And this is the reason why Money Matters uh, actually was created. It helps me a great deal because I am learning this stuff, but I was going doing this stuff anyways. Uh, maybe not necessarily with the news, but definitely with with the reading and the books and that kind of stuff. Uh, but now I wanted to do it publicly sort of shared, help other people saying, hey, let's do this together. Let's jump in. I'm going to share what I know. You're going to share what you know, and we're going to be better for it, right? This is the exciting piece of what we're able to do in today's day and age. So interested in flying, which I believe you should be. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, um, argue that if you are thinking of being successful in uh, business or with your investments or any of that stuff, you absolutely must be. Uh, the busiest, more successful people in the world find at least an hour to learn every day. So can you. And I absolutely agree. And the easiest way to do is just join me live on onedealaway.com uh, slash live every morning at 7 by 8 o'clock. We are out. Done. You can go about your day and uh, you will be amazed how much you're able to learn and how smarter you end up being once we're done. <laughs> three steps. I don't know why three was this, but it's this. Three steps. First, find the time for reading and learning. If you don't want money, watch Money Matters in the morning, you know, when do you watch it? Schedule time, do it. Consistent pound on that time and increase the results. So three steps. So find time. Join me at 7 a.m. right here. Sit there, sip on your coffee. I'm sipping on my coffee, which is almost done. And quite cold at this point, I have to report. Uh, sip on your coffee. Let's learn together, uh, right? And then it's that's the time, right? One hour at 7 a.m., up to one hour. Uh, consistent. Well, we go every single day at 7 a.m., so you have no reason, no excuse. It's not just you. You and I, right, are doing this stuff together. Um, and then three, increase the results. And you're going to increase the results by actually applying what you learn here to start thinking. So once you finish, you shut off the computer, you go away, wherever away is, whether you're going for a job, uh, take a shower, make breakfast, whatever, reflect, 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 and start thinking of how does this apply to me. So there you have it. This is today's show. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. You know, I really do hope that if you are missing today, uh, that you will join me tomorrow live. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and you like this video, do share it. Uh, do subscribe. Feel free to leave me comments. And uh, now we're going to um, end today's episode. I'm going to go hang out with people that are here live. Uh, but, you know, uh, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Hopefully you have learned something new. And hopefully you will take this whole deliberate learning and applied knowledge to heart and start learning every single day, thinking for yourself and experimenting with your own thoughts and testing to see are you right? That is the best way to learn. So until next time, stay forever, money blessed. And do remember, you are only one deal